Then, first of all, before beginning this actual presentation, I want to use this opportunity uh, to say congratulations to the host, uh, Tudor Braniste, who just recently got married. Uh, congratulations. Sorry, I cannot say it in person to you. Hopefully, in two years, we can meet again at the next uh, conference. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, my name is Leonard Siebert. I'm from the group of Rainer Adlung. Um, I'm doing currently my habilitation, and we are very interested in advanced uh, yeah, composite materials, and especially we're studying materials on the nano and micro scale. Um, I'm, I'm also involved with a lot of biomedical applications. The topic today I want to talk about is really interesting to us um, because it holds a lot of potential. I'm going to talk about interpenetrating composites. I think many of you have already heard of composites before. It's the combination of two types of materials. It can either be two polymers, or you can include glass fibers into a polymer to make fiber reinforced uh, composite. But this special property of an interpenetrating composite is that you have two phases which are continuous. So here, for example, in this cube, you have the red face and the blue face, and they interpenetrate each other. So you never have a rupture in one of the phases. Um, and this is quite a unique and interesting property a composite can have. Um, think of, for example, electrical conductivity. If you have now uh, the red face that is electrically conductive and the blue face would be an insulator, then still this whole material would be electrically conductive. This we have demonstrated, for example, by uh, fabricating um, aerogels uh, out of graphene. Uh, these are some hollow... Uh, uh, channels that are coated with graphene on the inside and outside you have some type of hydrogel. So this whole hydrogel gets conductive just because these two things are an interpenetrating composite. But I'm not going to talk about conductivity. I'm just going to talk about the mechanical uh, interesting properties that some of these um, uh, interpenetrating composites can have. So first of all, um, how do we actually fabricate uh, interpenetrating composites? So you can take, for example, a solid phase that has already such a porous structure that is interconnected with each other. Then you take something that first has a liquid phase, you can fill it inside. And then uh, when you can harden this liquid phase, then you get a composite where both of these phases interpenetrate each other. Unfortunately, this is not very nice to show in uh, 2D. Um, so I'm just going to show you the solid phase that we've used so you get a better understanding for how this is working. Um, this is now an SEM image of this um, melamine form aldehyde foam. Uh, this you can buy under the name Basotec. It's normally used for, um, um, for audio insulation. And uh, it's quite open porous, as you can see, and it forms this nice network of interpenetrating arms that are all connected to each other. So since this is very open porous, you can now fill this uh, with another type of material. If we want to learn something about uh, the mechanical properties of such a composite, it's of course very wise to first study the mechanical properties of the individual materials. And what you can do, for example, is now you take a cube um, of this um, foam material and you compress it. And what you then can see is the first time you compress it, it has quite a high uh, uh, modulus. So uh, the uh, slope here in the beginning is quite high. And then we, when you come back down and you compress it again, the modulus is uh, lower. So I have here a table where I have the cycles. So compression, decompression, compression, decompression. And you can see that the modulus, so this is the uh, slope here in the beginning, it's, it decreases over the number of cycles. So clearly something is happening to this material. And uh, what we did is we did some micro CT and we could then uh, make a really nice FEM simulation of this material. Um, I can show you this video briefly. I hope it looks as nice to you as it is to me. I can start it again. You can see this foam uh, nicely simulated. And the color here indicates now the stress that is arising or the deformation, if you will, inside the material. And so you can see when you press it from the right side, uh, then the stress is concentrated from the side that you press it. And the further you go on inside this material, the lower the stress. We can also see this uh, from a static image. Um, and when you look here into this orange or kind of red uh, area, which is uh, the side from which it's compressed, then you can see that individual connections inside this network are being strained more than others. You can see, for example, this knot here is quite red. 
um, while this knot here is quite green, so this knot here uh, takes up a lot of the stress uh, that comes into the whole material. So the stress is not distributed perfectly equally, but it concentrates in some of these areas. So these are then likely to fail uh, because they are just subjected to higher stresses. And uh, this is probably the reason for why we see this type of lowering in the overall modulus, because in the network, the more connections break, uh, the lower the overall contributions uh, to the stiffness of the network will be. But what you can also see that this somehow converges uh, onto one value, so it's not decreasing anymore after some time. And this means that all of the connections that have um, been stressed and broken uh, before, um, they are now not contributing anymore, but still you have a network in which all of the stress is distributed quite nicely. This depends, of course, on how much you compress this material, but this overall trend is quite nice to observe. So this is now some characterization you might do to such a network, but what about the other phase? Um, what you can do is you can take now, uh, for example, a silicone or another type of two component polymer. You can mix the individual component and it's the liquid. And uh, after some time it solidifies because it polymerizes and it hardens. So this silicone that we've used here is called Ecoflex. It's one of the most uh, uh, flexible uh, silicones I know. So stretch it really far and you can see that uh, here you have a quite nice linear behavior and the compression over the whole range so not as before here with this non-linear behavior but rather quite linear this is to be expected from such an elastomer what happens now if you combine these two uh, materials into one so first of all we kind of need to get the silicone inside this melamine foam sponge uh, and uh, this you would say, okay, it's quite easy, just pour it in, but it's of course never that easy. As you can see, it's really hard to fill out all of this material. You have to somehow get it to fill every nook and cranny and not leave any open spaces on the inside. So the technique that we have come up with is you take a small container. In this container, you can place a little bit of the sponge material, can place it inside this cavity, and then you have two parts of it. Um, here's a, a ceiling. And when you screw all of these together, then you have here a closed um, volume inside um, that you can uh, suck the air out of. So you apply a vacuum to this part. And then on from the top, from this side here, you can put a syringe that uh, still contains the liquid silicone. And what happens then after you've sucked the vacuum inside here, this is a three-way valve, you can turn it. And when you turn it, because there's a vacuum inside, the silicone will be sucked uh, from this syringe. Um, into this material and fill every cavity because there is no air inside currently. And by this uh, vacuum molding method, uh, you can also see that these holders are 3D printed. Um, you can uh, nicely uh, develop such composite materials and fill um, every nook. One uh, reason why it's hard to fill uh, these types of materials from the inside is that you get a lot of friction and turbulence uh, inside the materials. It's very hard to have laminar flow uh, inside these individual channels here. And this might be a reason why it's very difficult to fill from the outside. So uh, then you get such kind of composites, very nice. You can touch it, you can cut it and so on. Um, but the very nice thing about it is its unusual behavior, because what you find, um, you can see here once more the curves for pure sponge material, so the foam, and then for the pure silicone and low compression range, these are both linear. But if you find this composite, uh, it has a modulus that is increased by a factor of two from the pure sponge. So this is quite unusual. You would say, okay, you have these two materials and you combine it should have approximately the same modulus. So why should it be twice as high? Um, and one reasoning for this might be uh, in its microscopic behavior. So what you can see is that this material is made out of these kind of rings. And for simplicity's sake, I'm now going to project it into 2D so you have an easier understanding of what's going on. So these individual rings are formed inside the material because of its structure. And um, when you compress it normally without being filled, then you can see uh, that this angle phi is increasing while this angle theta is decreasing. It depends on the compression direction, but this is in generally the case. So in these corners, it can change the angle and thus uh, give way for the compression to happen. 
Um, so when you compress it, then theta goes uh, down and phi goes up. But what happens now if you fill the inside with the silicone? The silicone is incompressible, so um, you cannot just uh, reduce this angle here or increase that angle because there's silicone in the way. So if you press on it, rather than uh, uh, deforming, really, there is this type of force distribution on each of the individual arms. You know, the silicone is confined in this space. So if you deform it from the outside, all of the forces are transformed linearly into every one of these arms, like in a balloon, which you blow up. It also resists from its whole uh, structure. And since these are rather stiff here, the individual arms, this poses a force to the outside. This is quite an unusual behavior for such a micro system. But where we also know this from is from this type of packaging. Yeah, a package also doesn't fall apart because you wrap it quite tightly from the outside with the rope material in 3D. So you can compare this micro material to this macroscopic uh, known uh, form quite easily. Then another and maybe also the last uh, unusual point of this is when you already have it in a pre-compressed state when you fill in the silicone. Yeah, this is already compressed. I compress the sponge and then fill in the silicone. What happens is now you have this stiff axis. Okay, you say, we know this. We have seen this on the last slide. So you can compress it more in this direction because these arms are stretched. But what also happens is that in all other directions, for example, from this side where it's not pre-compressed, it uh, behaves softly again. It behaves like the pure silicone as if there wasn't even uh, any interpenetrating composite going on. So I think this is quite interesting because then by the pre-compression from this material, you can change uh, how the mechanical properties are, not changing anything about the composition, but rather just how you fabricate it. And in this way, you can introduce a very nice anisotropy into this previously isotropic material. The reason is, of course, that in this direction, these angles here can bend, while these angles do not reduce themselves anymore. Um, and therefore, you do not put a stretch on these outer bondings here. So, OK, you can say now this is uh, all nice and good. But what is this interesting for? I want to show you a material that's very similar to this. This is cartilage, as you find it, for example, in the knee or in other joints. And you can see that you have a very nice anisotropy uh, in parts of the material. So you have an anisotropy here and these fibers in the lower, in the so-called deep zone. Here in the middle zone, it's uh, arranged any which way, so it's quite isotropic. And in this um, superficial tangential zone, it's completely uh, in the other direction. So you could now fabricate uh, such type of material from this interpenetrating composite as I demonstrated by compressing it in different ways. So from the top, you could press it and from the side, you can press it from another side and therefore fabricate composites that have exactly this type of behavior. And with this, I'm already at the end uh, for this talk. This was a, a mechanical overview over such a um, yeah, interpenetrating composites. I hope you found it interesting and I'm really open for some questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. So if there are any questions, please. Maybe I can ask you a short question. Yeah, sure. How do you know, or how do you, yeah, when, when you have um, filled in the iron material structure with, uh, with a polymer? Yeah. 100%, or maybe you can control uh, uh, the composite ratio. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is your question, whether you can control yeah. it. How do you, how do you measure? How do you, do you know? Yeah, um, you know it. Uh, I can, for example, explain like this first experiment where we filled in uh, this material unsuccessfully. Then you can really see there's a cavity forming. Uh, maybe you can see it on this image. If you cut it from the inside, then it will still be hollow. Uh, in any other way, if you're looking for micropores and such, we can investigate su such things on the SEM. But what we have done before to just characterize the sponge is doing micro CT. In micro CT, you take the difference in density, and with this, you would also be able to see uh, micro cavities inside if there's some air missing. Uh, but we didn't observe this, so I'm quite confident that it's filled uh, with 100% of the polymer. Okay, and and uh, are different filling factors influence the mechanical properties? 
Um, yes, of course, if you have still the air inside, then you can maybe also tailor some of the mechanical properties. Because as you uh, have shown before, uh, the uh, modulus is lower when you do not have any silicone inside this material. And then if you have, for example, 50% only filled and 50% would be still air, then I would suspect that the material is 50% as uh, soft as uh, yeah, the uh, uh, full filled composite. But I don't know if it actually would behave this linearly. This is something we could investigate. OK. Good. Thank you. Then thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Daniela Ilinkai, and I am a scientific researcher at Petroponi Institute of Macromolecular Chemistry in Yash, Romania. And today I'm very happy to share with you some of our results on immunochitis and hydrogels, promising materials for candida infections treatment. Uh, here is a brief intro. Uh, here is a brief uh, overview of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction, and after that, I will present the experimental part with the synthesis and characterization of our system. Uh, kytosan based hydrogels are versatile materials with properties which recommend them for being used in many and diverse fields, uh, such as agriculture, wastewater treatment, or diapers industry. Moreover, because of Kytosan's biological properties, such as biodegradability, non-toxicity, biocompatibility, and many, many others, uh, Kytosan-based hydrogels represent an interesting class of materials with high potential of being used in bio-related applications. Uh, in order to be so, the cross-linking agents, which are usually used to cross-link and to hydrogelate Kytosan, must be also biocompatible. Uh, in this context, in our group, was developed new concept of uh, obtaining hydrogels based on chitosan and biologically friendly monoaldehydes. This uh, is possible due to the fact that the used monoaldehydes are able to form with chitosan dynamic polyimines which due to the immunization and transimination reactions are, and more than this, due to the hydrophilic hydrophobic segregation, are able to self-assemble into three-dimensional polymeric networks able to absorb large amounts of water, which are actually hydrogels. Today, I will present you a particular case which comes to strengthen this approach, the obtaining of hydrogels based on chitosan and 2-formylphenylboronic acid, a monoaldehyde known in the literature for its high antifungal activity. Therefore, Different hydrogels were obtained by varying the molar ratio between the amine group of chitosan and the aldehyde group of 2 formylphenylboronic acid. In order to characterize these hydrogels in terms of morphology and supramolecular architecture, the hydrogels were also leophilized, uh, leading to the corresponding serogels. Moreover, because NMR spectroscopy revealed the increase in time of the immune linkage density, reaching a maximum in seven days, hydrogels which were kept seven days before lyophilization were also uh, obtained and characterized. To confirm the synthetic pathway and to try to understand better the gelation process, a model compound has been synthesized by reacting 2-formylphenylboronic acid with D-glucosamine, which is actually the structural unit of chitosan. Uh, the IR spectra of the hydrogels and of the model compound showed significant change of their shape in comparison with chitosan, revealing the formation of um, the imine linkage by the appearing in the IR spectra of an intense absorption band at 1,624 centimeters to minus one, which corresponds to the group stretching vibrations of the newly formed imine. And also FTIR reveals some supramolecular rearrangements in the system. Very interesting was the fact that the maximum, which is attributed uh, to the inframolecular hydrogen bonds in the chitosan spectrum is shifted in the spectra of the xerogels to uh, higher wave numbers, indicating the formation of new inframolecular hydrogen bonds. If we take a look at the new immunoboronate unit which formed between chitosan and the aldehyde, this can be explained uh, by the inframolecular hydrogen bond which can form between the hydrogen from the boric acid residue and the electron-rich nitrogen uh, involved in the immune linkage. 
In this context, a stabilization of the newly formed imine by this intramolecular hydrogen bond can be foreseen. NMR spectroscopy was used as a complementary method to characterize the hydrogels from the uh, structural point of view. First, I have to mention that NMR spectra were recorded in deuterium oxide, and that is why in all the spectra, also in the spectra of the hydrogels and in the spectra of the model, uh, spectrum of the model compound, appeared the chemical shift corresponding to the unreacted aldehyde because of the fact that, as we all know, the acid condensation between uh, aldehydes and the mines uh, is a reversible reaction in the presence of water. In the spectra, spectrum of the model compound, two chemical shifts appeared, a less intense one at 8.7 ppm and the second uh, one, which is more intense, at 8.6 ppm, which corresponds to the imine proton in syn and anti-conformation. Very interesting, in the spectra of the hydrogel is the intensity of the signal switched, the first one becoming more intense, while the second one almost disappeared, indicating the predominant presence of uh, one imine conformation very likely the one which is stabilized by the intramolecular hydrogen bond which formed and which I mentioned uh, before. The supramolecular characterization of our systems was done by wide-angle X-ray diffraction. Of course, we recorded also the diffractogram of uh, Kytosan and used as reference. As you can observe, Kytosan diffractogram presented a broadband between 5 and 30 to theta degrees with two maxima at 12 uh, and uh, 21, while the Xerogel's diffractograms presented three diffraction peaks suggesting the supramolecular layered architecture as represented on the right side of the slide. The morphological characterization of the Xerogel's was done by scanning electron microscopy. As you can observe, as expected, all the xerogels presented a highly porous morphology with micrometric pores and quite thin walls. Uh, very interesting if we compare the morphology of the hydrogels which were obtained and lyophilized with the one of the hydrogels which were kept seven days before lyophilization, a more homogeneous microstructure was observed in the second case with uh, better defined pores and very interesting and important for the future application of these hydrogels, pores which are characterized by a narrow dimensional pore dispersity as could be observed from the standard deviation values. The viscoelastic behavior of the hydrogels was evaluated by neurological measurements at human body temperature, 37 Celsius degrees, and it revealed the fact that hydrogels can form between chitosan and the used aldehyde to form phenylboronic acid up to a molar ratio equal to 3.75 to 1, while for the last sample, the one obtained using a molar ratio between uh, reagents functionalities equal to 4, a liquid-like behavior was obtained, data which are in agreement with the visual monitoring of our samples. The antifungal activity of the obtained hydrogels was evaluated on two candida strains, candida glabrata and candida albicans, on both planktonic yeast and biofilm. Uh, for comparison, the measurements were carried out also for hydrogels components of similar concentration as they are in, uh, in the hydrogels, the chitosan solution and uh, 2 formula phenylboronic acid uh, solution. As you can observe, chitosan presented um, a very weak inhibition effect. It actually doesn't kill the candida strain, it just uh, slows down the fungi growing in comparison with the control sample, while the free aldehyde killed the candida yeast very, very fast. A similar trend was obtained also in the case of the hydrogel, but with a slower killing rate revealing the fact that due to the presence of the reversible imine linkages in the hydrogel structure, and more than this, due to the stabilization of this imine linkage by the intramolecular hydrogen bond, which I mentioned before, the hydrogel is able to release in a sustained manner uh, the antifungal aldehyde in the microbiological uh, medium. Very good results were obtained also on candida albicans and glabrata biofilms. You can observe that the hydrogel was able to reduce the metabolic activity of the biofilm with more than 
in comparison with only 7% uh, obtained in the case of the Kaitosan solution used as, uh, as reference. Uh, of course, aiming biomedical applications for these hydrogels, we evaluated also their cytotoxicity by uh, measuring the viability of the fibroblasts in the presence of hydrogels for different uh, concentration of 2-formyl-phenylboronic acid. And uh, quite good results were obtained, uh, meaning that uh, at concentration of aldehyde lower than 0.142%, the hydrogels are biologically friendly and the cell viability remained at more than 80%. Uh, percent. In conclusion, we successfully obtained new hydrogels based on chitosan and 2 formula phenylboronic acid by the acid condensation reaction of the amino group of chitosan with the aldehyde group of uh, the, the aldehyde. All the hydrogels presented a highly porous morphology uh, with, uh, with uh, quite uh, uniform uh, pores and characterized by narrow dimensional polydispersity. Uh, all the hydrogels presented biocompatibility as uh, demonstrated by the MTSSA and maybe the most important achievement of our study was the fact that due to the presence of the reversible immune linkages in the hydrogel structure and due, due to the stabilization of this immune linkage by the intramolecular hydrogen bond which formed uh, the hydrogel was able to release in a sustained manner the antifungal aldehyde in the microbiological culture, the hydrogel is presenting high antifungal activity against candida, uh, two candida strains, uh, against uh, candida yeast and biofilm. Uh, and all these data show that these hydrogels are promising materials for the treatment of candida infections. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is Zarina Gatel. I'm from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, and today I'll try to uh, talk a little bit about the charge transport in uh, different biomaterials and the influence water and uh, aqueous cations uh, have on the charge transport. Uh, so the motivation of uh, this study. Uh, lies in the field of bioelectronics and green electronics, uh, the rapidly evolving areas of knowledge where the intense process of the intense search of uh, biodegradable materials goes uh, and uh, with the good uh, conductive characteristics. Uh, and oh, while searching the appropriate uh, conductive materials within some uh, biological objects, such as uh, biological polymers or conductive bacteria, etc., uh, a few problems rise. Uh, the, <clears throat> the problems are in the uh, questions of charge transport. Uh, because there are different types of charge transport in biological materials <clears throat> and different types of charge carriers, such as ions, protons, and electrons. And uh, the main uh, thing the researchers have to deal with is the influence of water on uh, every type of the transport, uh, because water is... Uh, inevitable for functioning of, of every biological material, one should take into account uh, its influence uh, either on ions or on protons and electrons, uh, charge transport, such as diffusion or hopping, or as in case of protons, Grogus mechanism shown here. Uh, in biological materials, water is not the same thing that the water in the glass. So it usually exists in different bound states. Um, water molecules form hydration shells and uh, hydration networks within the bulk of the biological material. Uh, and while protonated, uh, water molecules form 
uh, different proton, uh, proton, uh, different clusters, uh, and different proton cation, protonic species, such as hydronium, uh, or tsundel cation, or eigencation, etc., etc. And these cations are regarded to be the major participants of charge, pro charge transport processes. Uh, in various condensed media, including biological materials. Uh, in the spectra, in the broadband dielectric spectra, uh, water manifests itself as uh, debiralization uh, in the gigahertz, terahertz frequency range. Uh, with the frequency lowering while the boundness of water uh, increased. So uh, we had three different biological samples. Uh, the first one was the extracellular matrix and filaments of the electrogenic bacteria Shivanellanidensis. Here on the left, you can see this bacteria. Uh, these threads are the extracellular matrix and filaments. These are the conductive uh, ones. Uh, and uh, while the, uh, this matrix uh, consists of uh, membrane and uh, different uh, proteins, uh, usually cytochrome type proteins, uh, we also chose uh, uh, cytochrome C protein as our second object for investigation uh, because it resembled in, in the structure and uh, anything the cytochromes of the extracellular matrix. Uh, and the last one object was the bovine serum albumin. This, was, this is a protein which has nothing in common uh, with the structure of cytochromes. Uh, or of uh, extracellular matrix and filaments, and it uh, it it wasn't uh, expected uh, the conductivity in this protein. Uh, so we uh, saw the uh, conductivity in uh, EMF. Uh, here, this shoulder in the low frequency part of spectra. Uh, shows the existence of Drude type uh, conductivity in uh, EMF. Uh, the same was observed by but lower uh, orders of magnitude lower uh, in the cytochrome C, while no uh, conductivity was observed in BSA. And this interestingly correlated with uh, the Debye response of bound water in the terahertz frequency range. Here in the left, you can see uh, the Dubai relaxation in EMF and in cytochrome, while there is no one in BSA. Uh, and uh, the existence of conductivity also correlated with the existence of translational and librational lines of water molecules uh, in the infrared region at about 200 uh, and 600 of reciprocal centimeters. Uh, so uh, this gave us an, an idea of the correlation between uh, bound water response and uh, charge transport existence in our samples. However, the exact ways in which water affects conductivity uh, in these materials, as well as the possible influence of aqueous cations, which are formed uh, from water molecules, uh, were not observed. And uh, so within the framework of current study, we took uh, our three biological systems uh, and analyzed the infrared transmissivity spectra in order to investigate the connection between the presence of aqueous cations uh, and the charge transport mechanisms in them. Uh, this was done by means of Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy with uh, vertex spectrometer, 
the the rehearsed results were obtained using time demand or time demand spectrometers. Uh, so moving on to the results here, you can see the infrared spectra of uh, imaginary part of dielectric primitivity. Uh, it was uh, fitted using the Lorentz model. And while not every single infrared line was of interest, and uh, the research was complicated by the existence of uh, strong lines of, for example, uh, amides uh, or some carboxyl group vibrations, which are characteristic for proteins and biological samples. There were several lines uh, which, uh, which we could attribute to the uh, aqueous cations response. So uh, the first bunch of lines uh, is connected with the response of hydronium ions. Uh, these are uh, vibration inversion mode at about 524 centimeters um, and uh, at about 1,000 centimeters, uh, as well as uh, stretching of the oxygen-hydrogen bond in the hydronium ion uh, near 2,700 reciprocal centimeters. Uh, uh, the interesting, it's interesting to note that uh, in EMF, where it was the most uh, uh, levels of conductivity, um, the intens intensity, the strength of these peaks were the, the most also. Uh, another bunch of lines uh, we attributed to the Tsundil cation response uh, located uh, at uh, 320 centimeters and uh, extra vibrations uh, near 1000 uh, centimeters. Uh, although it's very, uh, well, uh, it, there are not only the uh, these lines, uh, which attribute to response of aqueous cations. Uh, however, the um, analysis of them is complicated uh, by the location and overlapping with the modes of protein characteristic features. So here you can see these lines in the table. And uh, once again, it's interesting to note that in uh, EMF, which is the most conductive material, the response was orders of magnitude higher than in cytochrome or in BSA. Uh, uh, further, uh, one interesting feature was observed uh, with the translational and librational uh, vibrations in the infrared spectra, uh, because uh, the presence of the translational, uh, translational vibrations of water molecules um, and the dominance of translations over librations uh, uh, speaks about the presence of excess protons in the material. And again, in EMF and cytochrome, uh, we could see that the translational vibrations are uh, more dominant than librations. And the opposite situation was uh, observed for BSA protein. Mm. Again, speaking that uh, about the fact that in EMF and cytochrome, the number of excess protons is more is the biggest one. Uh, so, ending the spectral analysis, a few words should be said about uh, the broad and dense band in at about five, 50 reciprocal centimeters. So. Uh, while there are several hypotheses about the, its origin, including one relating this band to 
long-range protein vibrations. Uh, there is another one according to which this band might be a spectral feature of uh, oxygen bending mode of polygonal water clusters which form at the surfaces uh, of different proteins. However, the precise determination of this band uh, nature requires more research. Uh, so this brought us to the conclusions that uh, the that one can uh, use the infrared spectra uh, uh, for uh, searching the presence of excess protons in the materials, in the biological materials. And uh, the proton concentration was uh, orders of magnitude high, higher in EMF samples uh, than in cytochrome or in DSA. And this correlated with the transport characteristics of the samples, which we obtained, had obtained in our previous studies, uh, which says that uh, hydronium and sundial cation could be the main participants of charge transport process. Uh, however, uh, this need to be proven with more research, uh, so the work continues uh, on charge transport mechanisms in biological materials. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. In this presentation, I will uh, show some preliminary, preliminary results we have obtained on uh, publication of a surface enhanced trauma scattering sensor based on uh, gallium nitride ultrafin membrane for detection of uh, micromolar range rhodamine B. So the work is done in collaboration with the uh, Joint Research Center of uh, European Union, European Commission. So, as we know, there are many sources of contamination of uh, residual waters. Uh, for example, textile industry, pharma, oil industry, and uh, yeah, in fact, many, many other industries. And uh, one of the most abundant pollutant is uh, are the dyes. Also, the dyes can be used, as we know, in the uh, food industry. And uh, it is important to have a regulation or regulation by law in order to, to, to not exceed some concentrations because uh, these dyes can, could be harmful for human health. So the methods to detect the presence of a Concentration of the dyes in specific solutions can be different. Uh, mostly, it can be can be used some colorimetric methods. However, if the dyes get degraded in time, they can transform into some other molecules, which uh, which can also be harmful. So, in order to detect them, um, one of a good candidate for, for this is uh, or are the SERS sensors, which can detect uh, um, a signal from the molecules uh, at very low concentration. So the material which we use in our work is gallium nitride, and gallium nitride uh, has some special properties like it's a uh, wet bang up semiconductor with a 3.4 electron volt. Uh, it's a direct transition semiconductor. It is um, chemically and physically stable. It supports heterostructuring. And it was to mention uh, that uh, this material also, also possesses um, piezoelectric, uh, piezoresistive uh, properties. And it is also a uh, biocompatible material as it was uh, proved by. Uh, uh, many research groups. So it is the second most important semiconductor after silicon in the semiconductor industries. It is used for production of electronic components uh, due to its capability to work at 
high frequencies and uh, high power. Uh, it is used for production of sensors, different types of sensors, optical sensors, strain sensors, and so on. Uh, also for production of uh, optoelectronic components, for production of blue lasers, diodes, uh, lasers, uh, or for production of solar, uh, solar panels or use in the laboratory or for special use, for example, in uh, uh, aerospatial uh, applications. So now looking on the application medicine, it is already uh, used as uh, parts or as uh, hair thumbs in uh, prosthetics. It is used for muscle and nerve stimulators or uh, for fast recharging of electric wheelchair. wheelchair. So in diagnostic, it can be used for MRI or for colonoscopy. At the level of laboratory, it is also studied for tissue regeneration. But in this work, uh, our census is uh, fabricated on ultra-thin membranes and uh, we produce these membranes in our laboratory by using the so-called surface charge lithography. And um, this can be done in two ways, using a standard photolithography approach. Here we have initially a gallium nitride wafer, um, mostly grown gallium nitride on, uh, on sapphire substrate. The process is followed by a simple lithographic step where we open some specific windows for different features. Um, and then the material is uh, treated with low energy ions, for example, in, uh, with argon ions in a plasma system. But the disadvantage of this is a limitation, which is up to one, two micrometers. Another way, is to use the focus ion beam where uh, we are scanning a uh, desired pattern with uh, gallium ions uh, from the gallium source inside the field. In this case, we have a limitation up to few nanometers. And basically, during this step, we are inducing some uh, deep defect states into the material, which will trap the negative charges. And uh, these charges, or basically, generally to say the surface charge lithography is an approach based on direct writing of negative charges on the surface of a semiconductor. And uh, the charges will shield the material against photoelectrochemical etching uh, step, which is the next one. So in this uh, step, we use a potassium hydroxide solution uh, under certain conditions. And we are using a UV source um, and the focus it on the surface of material. And as you can see from the images on the right, we have uh, now perforated membranes produced by focus ion beam and or continuous membranes produced by a simple lithographic uh, process. So I have to mention that the material which was treated with ions will stay chemically stable under these uh, etching uh, conditions. Now, <clears throat> here you can see a cross-sectional view of a, of a single membrane. So you can see the thickness is about 50 nanometers. 15 nanometers, and it stays suspended on some gallium nitride nanowires, which are actually represent some predicting these locations in the bulk material. So they are also chemically stable during the etching process. We have also analyzed the cathodonescence, and as you can see, the regions which were treated with the uh, ions argon or gallium ions, they uh, have the uh, yellow luminescence, as you can see also in the CL spectra, with the uh, with band at 2.2 electron volts corresponding to the yellow luminescence and the 
second peak at 3.44 electron volts, which corresponds to three exciton transitions. Um, by using the transmission electron microscopy, we have also demonstrated that the material is a single crystalline good structure oriented along 11001 um, zone axis. The quality of the material it is uh, also proved by uh, Rama spectra. And in order to have a quantitative analysis on the chemical surface, we have performed the XPS analysis. As you can see in the initial gallium nitride wafer, we have uh, around 8% of oxygen. And uh, this uh, can be attributed to the um, native oxide layer. This was proved by looking at, uh, at the gallium 2P for the emission line. As you can see, there is a shift of about 0.7 electron volts to the fire binding energies, which, uh, which prove the, proves the oxidation state of the gallium. Now looking at the gallium nitride membrane, we also found around 7% of lead, which is uh, contamination, corresponds to contamination from the silver paste we used during the during the etching step, during the photoelectrochemical etching step, where we use it to contact the surface of material to the electrode. There is also a high concentration of oxygen, around 23%. However, it's not related to the oxidation of gallium. It's just, uh, it represents only contamination from uh, Paroxyl groups as a sample was uh, dipped into a water solution. So now in order to fabricate the, our search sensors, we have the initial membrane. Uh, we are depositing a five nanometers gold layer, continuous gold layer in a spotter coating system. The sample is uh, thermally treated at 300 degrees. And uh, as a result, the thin layer, the thin gold layer, gets coagulated into randomly distributed gold nanodots on the surface of the membrane. So in the end, looking at the performance of these sensors, we have found an enhancement factor of about 20, comparing the, the initial gallium nitride without functionalization and the, uh, and the functionalized one. So we use one micromolar rhodamine B in a ultra poor milliliter water for this experiment. And uh, yeah, the enhancement factor of about 20 was uh, determined by looking at the position 6048 centimeters minus one. And this enhancement is uh, the fact of the uh, excitation of the surface, surface plasmas and uh, enhancement of the electromagnetic field around the nanoparticles. So as a conclusion, we have fabricated this uh, CERS sensor. We have demonstrated the possibility to detect the rhodamine D in the micromolar range. The enhancement factor was about 20. And I have to mention that due to its high chemical stability, the sensor can also be used in acidic or basic condition, conditions for detection of our dust as well. And also due to its high conductivity because of the defects we induce into the material, it is also a good candidate for sensors which combine optical and electrical properties of the material. So, also, there are some needs of additional studies, which are still in progress actually, for determination of the detection limit, uh, and also for other dyes, and also to see the influence of the density of gold dots as, uh, as it, it has to be. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vlad, for your presentation, which is now open for discussions and comments. Please, if there are any questions.
Okay, I have one question. In one of your previous first slides, you wrote that you have limitation of two micrometers. After yeah. that, you are uh, presenting membranes with a thickness of 15 nanometers. Well, that was a, that was an image in a, on the cross-sectional view. So I showed the thickness of the membrane. However, the, the limitation of one, two micrometers is a photolithographic. Uh, it's a limitation of the photolithography. It's not depending on the thickness of the material we are obtaining. Ah, OK. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rusnak Dumitru. Uh, I am a PhD student at the uh, State University of Moldova. Uh, work title is uh, Wettability of Highly Conductive uh, Zinc Oxide uh, Doped uh, with Gallium and uh, Codoped with uh, Chlorine CT Ceramics uh, with uh, Various Gallium Content. Uh, here is a table of contents. Introduction. Zinc oxide is a well-known material, student. Uh, zinc oxide is a well-known material, uh, student in the last two uh, decades uh, for a fascinating uh, semiconductor, um, piezoelectric, optical and emission uh, properties. Non days uh, an increase is in insert uh, appeared to zinc oxide nanostructures uh, due to its uh, biomedical application, uh, controlling the morphology of nanostructures together with uh, semiconductor uh, and the uh, piezoelectric property mic uh, mm, is promising for uh, biosensor and uh, mm, trans uh, Producers. An important uh, property, uh, namely wettability of uh, water, uh, can expand the application of uh, solid surface uh, such as uh, surface cleaning, uh, corrosion protection. Recently, the chemical vapor transport CVT technique uh, was uh, proposed as an alternative approach uh, to sintering uh, highly conductive zinc oxide ceramics. A high pressure, uh, pressure of uh, doping uh, gauges uh, species uh, participate in CVT uh, reaction can uh, contribute to the form formation of ceramics. Uniformly doped in the gas phase, even uh, at low sintering temperatures. Approximately 1050 degrees Celsius. Is no, no type of uh, ceramics can be used as uh, magne magnetron targets for uh, depositions of uh, zinc oxide in films with uh, enhanced uh, conductive properties. Uh, the variability of uh, zinc oxide doped. Uh, with uh, gallium and codoped co with uh, chlorine, CVT ceramics has not uh, been investigated. Uh, the study of this, um, this uh, phenomenon is the purpose, uh, purpose uh, of the present work. Experiment. Uh, the zinc oxide and the gallium sand mixed powder was uh, sintered is uh, sealed quartz uh, chambers on uh, 1070 degrees Celsius for 48 uh, hours uh, using OCVT. Uh, the furnace with uh, the samples that uh, was uh, cooled at a rise of uh, 100 degrees Celsius uh, per hour after uh, sintering. At the sintering uh, temperatures, uh, hydrogen chloride uh, was utilized uh, as a 
transport agent with uh, loading pressure of uh, two atmospheres. Before analyzing uh, electrical uh, characteristics, our ceramics uh, sands were cleaned by annealing uh, at 300 uh, degrees Celsius for uh, 30 minutes uh, in a dynamic vacuum. Uh, the morphology was chosen using a scanning electron uh, microscope. Uh, the as sintering uh, cherangs were polished, uh, which are one uh, micrometer uh, diamond uh, passed before being acid in uh, uh, 0.5% hydrogen chloride equation uh, solution for uh, 30 90 second to eliminate uh, contamination and the uh, damage flows for wettability test. Uh, the density of the zinc oxide doped with gallium and codoped chloride ceramics is 5.3. Uh, which correspond to 94.5% uh, uh, of the uh, theoretical value. The, uh, the hardest is uh, 2 gigopascal, which uh, is um, comparable to zinc or single crystal hardness. Samples typical uh, have a diameter of uh, 25 million uh, millimeters and a uh, fixed of 1.5 uh, millimeters. Uh, one moment. Uh, the solubility limit of uh, galloxide in uh, zinc oxide in around 2 uh, and uh, 3 mole percent uh, unintentionally, uh, dot zinc, uh, zinc oxide uh, chloride ceramics has a grain width uh, average diameter the emitter of seven um, um, micrometers. Uh, the material with um, three mole uh, percent gallium oxides uh, consists of uh, grain width uh, average size of uh, 19. Uh, micrometers, uh, figure uh, 2b, then uh, when uh, the dopantin concentration is uh, 10 mole percent, the average uh, gray size is uh, increased to uh, 44 micrometers, uh, figure um, 2c. Uh, the existence of uh, zinc gallium oxide inclusions with a mean size uh, of around 5 micrometers is seen in the same image uh, of a mass doped uh, sample, uh, 10 mole percent, which uh, were recorded using a back uh, scanner electron detector. Uh, the surface of uh, any Intentionally, doped zinc oxide chloride uh, ceramics is generally smooth uh, as the doping level raises uh, the unpolished, uh, unpolished uh, ceramic surface uh, becomes rough, uh, rougher. There are many nano and uh, micro uh, voids. Uh, figure 3 uh, show uh, the research uh, between free electron uh, concentration and gallium oxide content with a uh, loading of uh, the 3 mole percent uh, gallium oxide, the mass conductive ceramics with a uh, free electron uh, concentration um, of uh, 5.4 uh, multiplicated uh, 10 to the um, 19 
can be obtained uh, at a higher doping level, a large fraction of the gallium donors uh, should uh, be involu- uh, involved in the gallium oxide or uh, zinc gallium oxide inclusions uh, when uh, the furnace is uh, slowly cooled the value of uh, an degrade. The surfaces of the uh, unintentionally doped zinc oxide chloride ceramics uh, showed and uh, an uh, hydrophil behavior. Uh, the water contact uh, NCA is uh, 76 degrees. An increase in the uh, gallium uh, content uh, leads to a strong uh, increase in uh, the CA value, value uh, to uh, 141 degrees. Uh, therefore, uh, the surface of uh, zinc oxide doped uh, with uh, gallium and uh, doped, uh, co-doped with uh, chlorine ceramics with a gallium content correspond to the solubility limit um, becomes uh, a hydrophilic state at a higher uh, higher doping level ca value decrease the, de- uh, the dependence of the water contact angle on the doping level uh, correlation with uh, the dependence of a free electron concentration. It can be uh, assumed uh, that a high concentration of free electron in uh, zinc oxide doped uh, with gallium and co doped with chlorine ceramics uh, surprises uh, the formation of surface defects. Uh, probab- Probably uh, oxygen uh, vacancies. Uh, acting as a threat for uh, water uh, mo- um, molecules, uh, causing the uh, switch, switch uh, of uh, zinc oxide surface be ever uh, from uh, hydrophilic to hydropoly. Uh, hydro- Big. Ample uh, surface of the uh, investigation uh, ceramic should have uh, air uh, pockets, uh, which should be an obtaining uh, factory factor increases uh, CA. The uh, roughness and the density of the surface voice are. Um, Minimal for uh, unintentionally doped zinc oxide chlorine ceramics and are uh, maximum for heavily uh, doped ceramics with uh, 10 mol uh, percent gallium oxide. The reaction <clears throat> of formation of uh, oxygen vacancies uh, can be written as follow. Uh, the equation uh, for the concentration and uh, pressure of sub- uh, substance um, participated uh, in the reaction can be written as follows. And um, E is uh, typical for uh, semiconductor materials. A uh, high con- concentration of free electron promotes uh, the generation of uh, um, Compensing uh, acceptor in, um, intrinsic uh, defect, uh, zinc vacancies in zinc ore, but uh, suppresses the uh, generation of uh, donor increases uh, defect, oxygen vacancies uh, or zinc um, interstitial in uh, zinc ore. Uh, in conclusion, zinc oxide uh, 
doped uh, with gallium and coated with uh, chloride ceramics uh, with uh, various gallium content, uh, very sintering using chemical vapor transport technique and uh, hydrogen chloride as transport agent. Uh, the solubility limit of gallium oxide in zinc oxide was estimated at about uh, two, three uh, mole percent. Mm, the wettability of uh, unpolished, uh, unpolished and uh, surface of uh, zinc, zinc oxide gallium chloride ceramics with uh, various gallium doping level uh, was investigation. The polished and uh, aged surface of uh, zinc ceramics is uh, in uh, hydrophilic, hydrophilic state. The water contact uh, angle is uh, 76 degrees. Uh, the presence of gallium impurity uh, leads to strong increases in uh, the water contact to 141 degrees. Uh, the behavior can be attribution attributed uh, to a high concentration of free electrons, uh, which uh, surplus the formation of uh, intrins intrinsic uh, surface defect. Uh, perhaps uh, oxygen uh, vacancies uh, acting as mm, trap for uh, water molecule. Air pockets, uh, one uh, unpolished surface of uh, zinc oxide gallium chloride. Uh, ceramics is an additional factor where increases the water contact length. Uh, the following uh, references have been uh, researched. And uh, thank you your, for attention. Uh, coordination compounds of copper 2, nickel 2, based on ethyl 4 benzoate. There are semicarbosons derivatives of the lethal aldehyde, antimicrobial and antifungal properties. The authors are Anna Rusnak, Greta Balan, and Aurelian Gula. Introduction. At present, antibiotics are the key elements of modern medicine, being indispensable in the treatment of bacterial diseases. Since the, the discovery of penicillin and its introduction into medical practice, antibiotics are indispensable not only in the treatment of diseases caused by pathogenic microorganisms, but also in the prevention of infections in the patients undergoing surgery, of those with weak immunity or suffering from cancer. A direct relationship of increasing the level of antibiotic use is antibiotic resistance. Among the most da dangerous resistance microorganisms for humans is Staphylococcus aureus and Escherichia coli. So there is a constant need for new chemotherapeutic compounds, which heighten selective antibacterial and antifungal activity, which can overcome the resistance of bacterial and fungi. Tiasomycobazons. Uh, an important class of organic compounds that have attracted significant attention into uh, the pharmaceutical industry due to their rich biological activity, activity, such as antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antimalarial, anti-tumor, and others. A yetyl 4 amino benzoate uh, pharmaceutical name benzocaine manifests anesthetic properties. The introduction of um, ethyl 4 benzoate, benzoate in position 4 of uh, tire semicarbazons allows the possibility of creating new compounds with antimicrobial properties, the skeleton of which will consist of two parts one part antimicrobial properties and other anesthetic properties. Uh, the introduction of um, salicyl aldehyde derivatives is aimed at obtaining a more soluble substance 
and at uh, coordinating the OH group in 3D metals. Uh, coordination of thiosemicabazons to 3D metals, for example, copper 2, is beneficial because it reduces the dose of minimum inhibition concentration approximately 5 to 10 times compared to uh, uncoordinated thiosemicabazons. The goal. Synthesis and research of antibacterial and antifungal properties of new coordination compounds of copper 2, nickel 2, based on ethyl 4 benzoate semicarbazons derivatives of salicyl aldehyde. Objectives Synthesis of ethyl 4 benzoate semicarbazons derivatives of salicyl aldehyde. Synthesis of coordination compounds of copper 2 and nickel 2 based on these ligands. Determination of the composition and the structure of new. Uh, compounds using IA spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, one um, hydrogen enema, 30 carbon enema, any element analysis, and magnetochemistry, research of antibacterial and antifungal properties. Uh, ethyl 4 amino benzoate 1 was reacted to with um, uh, tetramethyl to around the sulfide. Uh, uh, this is a, a scheme of uh, this. Um, of uh, ethyl 4 uh, benzoate semicarbazons derivatives of salicyl aldehyde. Uh, ethyl uh, 4 amino benzoate 1 um, was reacted with tetramethyl to around the sulfide in a 1 uh, to 1 molar ratio on heating in dimethyl formamide to, from, to form ethyl 4 dimethyl carbotyl amino benzoate 2. In the second stage, uh, compound 2 was subjected to thermal degradation in a dioxine with sulfuric acid um, uh, to form isothiocyanate 3. Isothiocyanate 3 can be obtained directly from the amine 1 in a single step with thiophosgen in the presence of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Um, <clears throat> ethyl 4 hydrazine carbotyl uh, amino benzoate 4 can obtain it by the dropping the ethanol solution of isothiocyanate 3 to ethanol solution of hydrazine hydrate. Thiosemicabazons uh, noted by H2L2, H2L1 and H2L2 were obtained uh, following the condensation between thiosemicarbazide 4 and the corresponding aldehy aldehydes. 2-hydroxy-3-methoxybenzaldehyde and 2-hydroxy-naphthalene-1-carbaldehyde in ethanol with uh, 3 to 4 drops of glycyl acetic acid. The reaction uh, mixtures uh, were refluxed uh, for 2 to 3 hour, hours. Uh, the total consumption of thiosemicarbazide uh, 4 was confirmed that by chromatography. The purity and structural formal formula uh, were confirmed by TLA chromatography, I uh, spectroscopy, one hydrogen, 30 carbon nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Based on the synthesized ligands H2L1 and H2L2, 12 coordination compounds were obtained by mixing the cells solution of copper 2 and nickel 2 solution in ethanol and ligand solution in ethanol. Uh, in a one-to-one -one molar ratio, then reflux for half an hour, obtained as a green microcrystalline complex according to the reaction written on the slide. Uh, metal analysis uh, uh, shows that the coordination ratio to the metal and ligand uh, in the complex is one-to-one. Magnetochemical research has shown that the copper complex have a monomeric structure because their effective magnetic moments correspond to an uncoupled electron. Nickel complex are diamagnetic and have a square planar structure. The highest spectra of synthesized complex complexes suggest that the azomatin functional Group, group new C double bond N, um, 1594 centimeters minus one, 
uh, moves at uh, higher uh, wave numbers compared to, to uncoordinated lig ligand, 1580 centimeters minus one. New benzapea, new OM, NM, SM at 596, 565, 445 centimeters minus one that are missing in the spectrum of the ligand. <clears throat> the tonic group of new C double bond is uh, 1244 centimeters minus one moves at a lower wave number compared to uncoordinated uh, ligand uh, 1265 centimeters minus one. Suggested uh, the formation of the SM coordinative bond. The absorption band uh, new OH uh, 3298 centimeters minus one disappears from the spectra of the coordinative compounds, which speaks of its deprotonation and the formation of the OM bond. In the bond, in the case of coordination compounds based of uh, copper and nickel acetate salts, ligand is double deprotonated tridentate confirmed by the appearance of a new vibration band of the amine group, new C double bond and two, or 1600 centimeters minus one, and the disappearance of Tivoni group, uh, new C double bond S. According to IR data, the ligand coordinates tridentate uh, to the metal uh, through the tionic sulfur atom, uh, azomethyl nitrogen atom, and uh, oxygen phenolic atom. Ligand can be monodeprotonated or double deprotonated. Uh, the results of the antimicrobial activities of the synthesized compounds on Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, Escherichia coli, Acinobacter baumannii strains, minimum inhibitory concentration and minimum bactericidal concentration are in the range of 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams per milliliter. Uh, the results of antifungal activity of the synthesized compounds on Candida albicans and Candida crustae strains Minimum inhibitory concentration and minimum fungal concentration are in range of um, 0 0.125 to 0 0.55 milligrams per milliliter. In the case of uh, nickel L1 HL1 um, chlorine complex, a selectivity is observed of on cryptococcus uh, neoformans with MAC equal 0 0.016, MFC equal 0 0.031 milligrams per milliliter, and is twice as active as the control substance nistatin. Conclusions. Uh, two new ligands and 12 coordination compounds of copper 2 nickel 2 based on ethyl 4 benzoate diacemicabazoans derivatives of salicyl aldehyde were synthesized. A determination of the composition and structure of a new synthesized compounds, compounds was, was using IR, NMR spectroscopy, element analysis, and magnetochemistry. Uh, the best results of antifungal activity were recorded on nickel HL1 chlorine complex. A selectivity is observed on, on cryptococcus neoformans with which MAC equal uh, 0.016 milligrams per milliliter, and it is twice as active as, a, as the control substance nistatin. Uh, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Anna Rusnak. I am a PhD student at the third year at State University of Moldova. My work, I'm a, I am a chemist. I work uh, as a young researcher in the state projects with title new, new innovative products with outside performance in medicine, elucidation of the molecular and cellular mechanism of the action of these new products and argumentation of their use in 
efficiency of the treatment of some pathologies. In this um, project, uh, I work on fine organic synthesis, synthesis of coordination compounds, elaboration of scientific article, participation in conference. Uh, Koto is a doctor, associate professor, Professor Greta Balan. She works at the State University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Nikolai Stimitsan. Uh, another co-auto uh, co is habilitated uh, doctor, university professor, academician, Aurelian Gula. Thank you for your attention. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Emil Najah Soud, the PhD student in Karabuk University, Turkey. Uh, first, it's my pleasure to be here and sharing my our works in the fifth international conference of nanotechnology and biomed biomedical uh, engineering. Uh, our work it will be investigation the effect of adding tantalium on the microstructure and mechanical properties of the biomedical titanium. 15 molybdenum alloy with the groups, uh, Prof. Hassan Shakir Mejdi and uh, Dr. Erkan Koch and Dr. Amin Al -Jubori. First, the introduction about the subject. Tantal uh, titanium and its alloy have been used as a structured biomaterial to replace a heart tissue such as bone and dental implant due to their external characteristic, such as corrosion resistance, biocompatibility, and low density. In general, the modulus of elasticity of titanium is about 8 to 10 times greater than that the natural bone, approximately 10 to uh, 16 gigabyte, uh, gigapascal. Corrosion resistance has an important significance when dealing with the biomaterial. The fluid present inside the human body creates an overall grievous environment, such as bearing containing chloride, a series of organic acids, and other component titanium and aluminium. About our alloys, however, study has shown that the liberation of aluminium and vanadium ion present in the alloys such as titanium six aluminium four vanadium can cause some healthy problems over the course of time. It's known that the aluminium ions cause, uh, cause uh, neurological uh, dis disorders and vanadium ion exerted with enzymatic distribute among their problems. Because of these problems, titanium alloy for biomedical application have been developed without of use of toxic elements using materials such as nobelium, tantalium, zirconium, molybdenum, and ion, leading to development the alloys system such as titanium 13 nobelium, uh, 13 zirconium, and our, uh, our our work titanium 15 molybdenum alloys the problems and solution one of the most important properties which put serious limitation of the performance of the titanium alloy as implant material for the artificial joint such as for example hip or knee or shoulders or joints it's the higher modulus uh, higher elastic model uh, modulus of elasticity of the alloys. It is usually that the stiffness of the implant material be as close as possible to the connected bone. The elastic, elastic modulus mismatch between the biomaterial and the surrounding bone is the key reason why successful fixation of the implantation material to the bone tissue remain a, ch a challenge. However, the implant material must be solid to resist enough the survey, the physiological load applied on them are required to operate for much longer duration or enter lifetime without loose or revision surgery. For the solution further, the young modulus of the beta type titanium alloy decreased the bend on the manner processing perf performed to control the crystallographic texture. Besides, the elastic modulus can be varied or changed by adding some focus elements such as our works for adding tantalium. The experimental part, the TI-15 molybdenum X tantalium system 
was produced by powder mythology method under an inert atmosphere paragon. We have a fabricate for sample were produced as following. The titanium, molybdenum, molybdenum, and titanium powder are mixed using a bone milling machine. An automated powder sample remove machine was employed at three, six, nine, and 12 hours post milling to characteristic the powder and evaluate the mechanical alloying process. Grinding generally arise the temperature inside the, in the, inside the bowling. The overhaul heat was lowered by operating the milling in cycle of 19 minutes milling and 15 minutes rest. Then cold pressing at 900 megapascal for 1.5 minutes with loading rate produce the grain compact 0.4 ton per second. Then centering for getting the grain compact by uh, for six hour at 900, uh, 950 centigrade with heating rate, heating rate five uh, centigrade in minutes, followed by calling in vacuum furnace. Finally, we go to the crystallization of the prepared specimens. First, the chemical composition as shown in table below, table one, the chemical composition of the, our product uh, samples, as we see when we are increase the concentration, we have the concentration of tantalium that will be effect on their properties such as physical and mechanical properties. The physical properties of the centered specimen as shown in table, uh, table two, sorry, uh, the porosity and the density of the prepared alloy for the density and the porosity. As expected, sorry. It's indicate that there is a disagree in the porosity value of the specimen after centering as the titanium, uh, tantalium contain increase due to the better in air diffusion caused by the, these additives. And also, as expected, the density it will be increased as the increasing in the uh, tantalium uh, contain or concentration due to the higher density for the molybdenum and the tantalium when it's compared with the titanium density. For the XRD diffraction analysis, we can see from figure uh, the, for the fourth uh, samples, it's observed that all the peaks, it will be the beta phase for the prepared alloys. Uh, that's because first, the molybdenum is a strong beta stabilizer been able to initiate the beta phase rotation at the concentration between uh, 9 to 10 percent and it will be fully phase uh, beta phase it will be uh, between the concentration 15 and 20 percent and the second reason is the tantalium is act as a slightly to stabilize the beta phase for this it can be seen that both alloy elements are acting as a beta stabilizer since there was a completely fermentation of the beta phase in the concentration above the 15 and 20 of molybdenum. For the SEM result for the sample of prepared specimen, as we see from figure for the fourth samples, it's observed that the morphology of the all alloy is characteristic of beta phase, and this is arrangement. Mm -hmm. Agree, agreement with the XRD fraction, and it was impossible to observe another phases like uh, alpha phases that will be led to uh, weak the mechanical properties due to the small relative quantity. Also, it can be observed that the angle of the grain boundary is approximately 120 and characteristic of uh, material in equilibrium. For the mechanical properties of the repair sample, first, the hardness. Because hardness for the specimen can be seen from uh, table four, it can be seen that the, the hardness it will be increased as the tantalium concentration increase. And this is increasement is due to the 
tantalium function in stabilizing the beta phase and decreasing the porosity as we see in the table mentioned before. For the compressive strength, the compressive test result obtained from the stress strain diagram are close, clearly show in table five. The we can see the compressive strength, it will be increased as the increasing in the tantalium concentration that it, uh, as expected due to the increase in, in the density with the titanium content. Otherwise, the elastic modulus that the key point for our product or our works. As we as we know, yeah, as we know, if we are want to pr uh, product product a sample for testing uh, elastic modulus testing, it's very very. It's sometimes it will be difficult to produce by powder production method. Because of that, we are choosing a non-destructive test. It's called ultrasonic wave test. For investigation, the elastic deformation behavior are essentially for understanding the mechanical response of the biomedical material. Be depending on the velocity of the vertical and long long longitudinal uh, velocity, as we mentioned in the in our papers, increasing from the result, increasing the titanium con uh, contained increase the phase lattice parameter. The modulus is linking to the crystal structure and the interatomic distance inside the crystal lattice. Thus, increasing the phase the, uh, titanium concentration will be de decrease the elastic modulus. As you can see in the table six, the elastic modulus of the prepared alloy it will be decreased. And that's what what we want because the degree uh, decrease in the elastic modulus it will be avoid the mismatch between the alloy and the natural bone. And also the wear resistance for the prepared sample specimen, trilogical sample were evaluated on the wear tester for dry uh, sliding contact airforms at a 25 centigrade temperature. The samples were polished uh, to mirror finish before testing. Samples have uh, the, the tester condition, it will be the surface area for sample, it will be six millimeter and exposed to the normal loads, different load, one and uh, three newtons with a sliding velocity, it will be about 1.1. Also uh, for the test condition, it's struck uh, five, five uh, millimeter and the total uh, sliding distance, it will be 75 meter. And uh, we can see the 2D uh, profile for the all samples and for the tables uh, that mentioned in the figures, it will be about the specific wear rate for all samples. From, from the figure and from the tables can be seen that the specific wear rate will be decreased as they are increasing in the tantalium alloy. And it will be reached for, uh, and it will be changed from 3.51 to 2.25. So the wear rate, the wear rate of each sample where uh, across this load, it showed that the base alloy of titanium had lower wear resistance among the test sample. The addition of titanium reduced also the corrosion, uh, sorry, the wear rate for the prepared alloy. Also, we can see the SEM figures for the specimen after the wear resistance. It can be seen. The warm surface tribology, uh, topography for the samples may be described as a rough and with sign uh, of plastic deformation along with the grooves parallel on the, to the sliding direction. In general, the warm surface show a dehazer uh, wear characteristic excited with the material transfer to the counter face. The material transfer from the produced alloy induced counter face darking, which in divide uh, with increasing the test load. In conclusion, from the result obtained, the joint action of tantalium and molybdenum to the stabilized beta phase may be interesting for 
to form beta titanium alloy with low alloying element and with low uh, elastic modulus. The mechanical strength is initially factor for the processing of impl implant as it avoid defect in the material. The hardness and the compressive strength of the alloy prove to be higher than the commercial pure titanium, which indicate their greater mechanical strength, especially when we are used for implants for knee or for hip replacement. Based on the result also obtained from this work, the titanium 15 molybdenum 20 uh, titanium alloy obtained the most significant potential for the biomedical application. However, further corrosion res uh, resistant test and biocompatibility can be provide better information about the properties of these alloys. Thank you for attention.